This message was delivered to Christ Our Rock Bible Church on Good Friday, April 19th, 2019, by the Reverend Roy D. Warren, Jr. Father, we want to thank you, dear God, for the glory of this day. Um, we, we wonder sometimes, why do they call it Good Friday? Why do they call it Good Friday? Seems like it's a very bad Friday that Jesus dies on the cross. But without the cross, we're not going to make it. Without the cross, we're going to be separated from God forever. Without the cross, we have nothing. The cross, in the sense of what it provides, sets up the resurrection, is a very good thing. We thank you for it. I see on some of the commercials... <laughs> Uh, and ads and things that fly around that they've uh, kind of made this the new uh, Black Friday. It, it's, it's Good Friday, but they're calling it Black Friday. And they're linking it to the day after Thanksgiving so that they can boost sales right before Easter. <laughs> it's incredible how people can change things around and pervert it. I just pray, Lord, that we just have our focus on Jesus here tonight. Help us, dear God, to be a people that know the fullness of what you have for us. And I pray, dear God, that as we come before you this night, you, dear God, will come before us and you will truly give of your heart in this day and in these coming days as well. We thank you, Lord. You're worthy, dear God, to be praised. Amen. Worthy to be praised. As I've mentioned a couple of different times through the Lenten season, but also I believe even tonight, uh, you know, there is an emphasis throughout all of this of communication. It's something we've been seeing with every step of the way. Jesus takes time to communicate. At the same time, we find out that God is hiding some of these things that are being communicated. Doesn't seem to make sense, God. Why don't you just make it clear instead of hiding something? He hides it so that, and he says this clearly, by the way. I'll show you on Sunday. He says this clearly. On Easter Sunday, when you see the risen Lord, not just hear about him, not just hear it from the women, not just hear it from the angels, not just hear it from other people who have seen Jesus. That didn't do it. That did not do it. It's when everybody individually met the risen Lord. That's what did it. Amen? Do you hear me? I think this is crucial. All right, we'll see that as we go. And especially on Easter, because that's when God said that it would become known. It's as they met the risen Lord that they would, ah, you know, understand what Jesus said. Back a ways. He kept it hidden. <laughs> and a lot of people look at that and they think that's, you know, why would you do that, God? Why wouldn't you just, you know, let it be known and let it be clear? He didn't want people to know him because of hearsay. He didn't want them to know him because somebody else knew it and, and shared it. And by the way, there's nothing wrong with testimony. There's nothing wrong with, you know, somebody sharing something that God did for them and so forth and so on. But where it really counts is when you actually meet Jesus. Amen? All right. Sometimes to communicate well, one must start by getting attention. You got to get somebody's attention. Remember the old joke about you got to get the, you know, the mule's attention. So you take a two by four and whap him across the side of the head. And, and the guy asks him, well, why'd you do that? Oh, well, I got to get his attention first. <laughs> there's there's, there's got to be, he, he's, he's got to have us focused on him. You know, when you're dealing with somebody that, let's just say, isn't hearing all that well, you know, lack of, of hearing ability, uh, it's not a bad idea to go ahead and start everything you say to them with their name. They'll suggest that, by the way. Speech therapists and so forth. 
you know, you start everything with their name. That gets their attention. Then they're hearing more clearly, even though they may be limited in their hearing, they're going to be focused and they can hear more clearly that way. Uh, or just plain figure after you say the first five words, you're going to have to say them again. Because the person will say, what? What? Amen? You got to get their attention first. And I believe this was the case with a fellow by the name of Franklin B. Murphy. Franklin worked for the uh, Wingate Motor Company for years. And the company was in the process of purchasing group insurance for the employees. It's the first time it had been done. It was somewhat innovative back in the day. And, uh, but that was their plan. They're going to get everybody insurance. The only condition of the insurance was that there must be 100% compliance with the workers. Every one of them must sign up for it. Only one employee not deciding on the insurance would jeopardize the whole works. Everybody would lose out. Of course, <clears throat> Franklin B. Murphy refused to sign up for the insurance. Even though 285 other employees out of 286 did sign up. The foreman begged Franklin to sign up. The shop steward pleaded with him. The plant superintendent and the general manager spent hours trying to reason with Franklin and urging him to sign up for the plan. Finally, the head honcho, the general chairman of the board, asked Franklin to come into his office. And when he came in, offered him a seat and said, Franklin, I want to level with you. Unless you sign up for this plan, you're fired. I'm going to fire you. Everyone else wants the insurance but you. You decide right now if you want that insurance or your job. And old Franklin B. Murphy grabbed the pen and signed up immediately. Why didn't you sign up before this? Franklin was later asked. Well, he replied, no one ever explained it to me as clearly as the chairman did. <laughs> Communication. As Jesus got closer and closer to the cross, his communication became more and more intense. Do you remember it? Do you remember the first step we took? It was Jesus telling them, What's going to happen? I'm going to suffer, die, and rise again. It's basically all he told them. They didn't get it. The Bible makes clear that they didn't get it because God didn't give it to them. He hid it from them because he wanted them to know Jesus first, the resurrected Lord. Amen? Okay? But it did become more and more intense. Because then if you turn a few more pages and the second step involved him telling them again. Only this time it's filled with all the detail. They're going to pull my beard. They're going to slap me around. They're going to scourge me. They're going to do this. They're going to do that. And of course they got it, right? No, they didn't. They didn't get it either. That Not that time either. You would think they would. I mean, it's starting, it's, you know, clearer. It's plainer. It's more detail. But God hid it. I think we need to understand this. And maybe it would help us in our communications with other people when we see them not getting it, when we try to give them something or share something with them. It could be that God is holding it from them until they see the risen Lord. Amen? So it's not just us. It's going to be true for everybody. If it was true for the disciples, it's true for everybody. God holds certain things until it's time. So then why tell us about it in the first place? So that on Easter Sunday you can remember it. If Jesus didn't tell them anything days and weeks and months before that, when it came to Easter Sunday, they wouldn't remember that Jesus said this and this and this if he didn't. You see what I'm saying? 
Amen? All right. And when he got right up to the cross, and you remember, uh, you know, he saw uh, King Herod, and, and uh, he was, uh, you know, mum's the word, you know, zip, pick a lock, you know. I mean, you know, the, Jesus wasn't going to tell him a thing. All he wanted was some miracle. All he wanted was just some hearsay. He wanted to see some special thing done. And God is saying, "Uh uh-uh. That's not the purpose of those things. The purpose of those things are to build faith, not to create faith. And that's where the church has gone pretty much in a wrong direction lately. They've set it up so that the miracles and the special things and all of that are intended to, you know, create faith. And that's not what they were for. They were to build faith. They were to strengthen faith. Everybody see that? Amen? Okay. Well, his adversaries did not deserve his communications. Jesus knows who wants them and who doesn't. So he cut it off. At that point, Herod got nothing. And then came the cross. And with the cross, a great deal of communication. There are seven things that Jesus said. Seven separate things that he said from the cross. All right? Now, don't get confused on the times when you talk about the sixth hour, you talk about the ninth hour, or any of those things. Don't worry about that. I'll just tell you in our time, you know, or our clocks, what time it was, okay? The reason the Gospels are different about this is because, uh, for example, uh, Mark's Gospel you'll find to be different than John's when it comes to talking about the timing of things. And one reason for that is that one gospel is using the Palestinian version of how to tell time, and the other gospel is using the Roman. And so it's called differently. In the Roman, I believe, and I I don't want to get too detailed on this, it doesn't matter, but in the Roman, I think it's that, you know, the day starts at midnight, which is similar to what we have, right? We have 12 midnight, and then we have 1 a.m., right? So it's the morning in the middle of the night. All right, but the Palestinian approach sees the beginning of the day at sunrise. So it's going to sound like it's at a different time, but it's not. It's just because there's two different ways of of calling it time, and the Gospels do it in different ways. All right, so let's not worry about that. From 9 a.m. until 12 noon, Jesus was on the cross for the first three hours. From 12, I'm just going to go by our time, okay? 9 a.m. to noon, that's the first three hours. During those three hours, there was the first word from the cross. And uh, we're going to just have, we're going to label every one of these so we're clear as to which one it is. This word is the word of forgiveness. And you can probably all recite it. You probably all know it. Uh, But I want you to turn to it because I want you to see it. If you'll turn to Luke chapter 30, no, 23. Yeah, turn to Luke 23. Luke 23, uh, 32 to 38. Okay, you ready? This is Luke 23, beginning with the 32nd verse. And there were also two other And then it's got a comma there. It's kind of interesting. There were two others, basically is what it's saying, malefactors. See, if it didn't have the comma there, you would be inclined to think that it's saying that Jesus was also a malefactor and there were all three of them, you know? If it said, and there were two other malefactors, the other would make it clear that Jesus was too. But there's a comma there. And that comma helps us to see that he's, he's going to be on a cross all right, but he's the son of God. Now, he became sin for us. That is very true. All right. And then people, they jazz it up a little bit. They say, well, he stole our hearts. So, yeah, he's a thief. You know, he stole our hearts. No, he didn't. He presents himself. And if you want him, you get him. You take him. Do you hear me? He doesn't steal your heart. He's not going to force you 
to line up with him. He gives you what he wants to give you, and then you decide about it. Amen? You see what I'm saying? So anyway, there's an important comma there. Led with him to put to death. Okay, so all three of them are going to be crucified. Malefactors is just a fancy 75 cent word for wrongdoer or criminal. Some versions say thief, that both these guys were thieves. I'm not saying they weren't. They were wrongdoers. They were, they were criminals. They were crooks or something. You know, you don't know exactly. Anyway, uh, they're led to be crucified. And when they were come to the place, which is called Calvary, Calvary. This is interesting. Perhaps, I'm not sure I ever shared this with you before, but the Greek word for Calvary, now, there's the word Golgotha too, but the Greek word for Calvary is uh, cranion, cranion, very similar to the word we have for your skull, cranium, all right? That's where it comes from. And it's believed that this spot, this location, looked like a skull. I don't know how. I don't know how. Would it have three holes in it or something? You know, the two eyes and the nose, maybe a mouth or something. I don't know. And I don't know if it was like a, um, you know, the whole hill looked like a big, you know, it had caves running all through it. Could be. Okay. But anyway, Calvary. There they crucified him. And the malefactors, one on the right hand and the other on the left. Then said Jesus, and here comes the first word of communication to them and to us. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they are doing. And I want you to think about that literally for just a minute. Uh, they didn't. They didn't. The Jews just want him dead, but they're not seeing that he's the Messiah. I mean, I, they might have believed it and not cared. I don't know, okay? But I'm not so sure, you know, that they really understood that they were killing God's son. Maybe some of them did. But, you know, may, they knew not what they were doing. The Romans certainly didn't have a clue. They were dragged into this by the Jews, and it's not just the Jewish population, it's the Jewish religious leaders. They're the ones that were causing the problem. And so now the Romans are actually in on it, and they're making the official proclamation that he's to be killed. They, they know not what they do. Father, forgive them. Now, they're going to have to repent. I mean, if there's going to be forgiveness, there's... You know, the need to repent. It's all through the scripture. Repent, repent, repent. Okay? But he's calling on the Father and he says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. In other words, God isn't just going to nonchalantly, I suppose you could say, just go ahead and forgive everybody. Like, you know, wave his hand and, okay, it's, it's over. Don't worry about it. I understand. I'm God. You're not. It's okay. You're bound to sin, so don't worry about it. That's not God's stance on this stuff. Amen? He's calling them to repentance. He called everybody to repentance. Amen? Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment, and cast lots, okay? And the people stood beholding. They stood beholding. It's a word that pops up numerous times in this Good Friday series, so to speak. This series of statements, beholding. I'll show you more detail later. And the rulers also with him derided him. Derided him saying, he saved others. Let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. See, it's like, okay, we know he's the Messiah, but, you know, we're going to mock him for a while. Uh, you know, I've said this before, and, and I'm just suggesting it as a possibility. There are people that think, you know, well, um, you know, uh, well, and let me just tell you, I'll, I'll just tell you. Uh, there were a bunch of people gathered around, and many of them were trying to get Jesus to come down from the cross. I wonder maybe if Satan, who was trying to get Jesus on a cross in the beginning, 
trying to get him crucified, leading the whole thing, you know, with Pontius Pilate and Herod and the whole thing, just leading the whole thing on. And now all of a sudden, I wonder maybe if all of a sudden a light bulb went off in Satan's head. Because, you know, don't forget that he is not all-knowing. He is not God number two. He could be totally wrong. And Satan, by the way, is totally wrong. <laughs> Amen? Right? Well, so uh, all of a sudden, I wonder. I just wonder, okay? I'm giving it as an idea that uh, I wonder maybe if... Um, uh, Satan isn't recognizing that, uh, you know, maybe I shouldn't fought so hard to get him on this cross because, you know, maybe he's starting to see the light on this and see, you know, what is going to happen. You know, if, uh, I mean, Jesus even says right from the cross, you know, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. You know, it sounds like God's in control of this situation. Okay. And uh, I wonder maybe if all of a sudden the people start you know, Satan starts telling the people, get him down, get him down, get him down. Get him off this cross. We got to ruin the salvation plan. And I'm telling you, left and right, people are trying to get him off the cross. He saved others. Let him save himself. If he be Christ, the chosen of God, and the soldiers also mocked him. There's another group that didn't quite know what they were doing. All right. Praise God for the, uh, for the uh, centurion who later would recognize Jesus as, as a just man and as the son of God even. Praise God for that. And not only that, there's one gospel that says it wasn't only him, it was all the soldiers. <laughs> so it's not just one soldier, it was all the soldiers. They all recognize him as being special. The soldiers also mocked, and the soldiers came to him and offered him vinegar and saying, if thou be the king of the Jews, save thyself. Even the soldiers are trying to get him down from the cross. I just wonder. I, I, just, I just wonder. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Kind of reminds you of the uh, grace being sufficient, right? The grace is sufficient. Amen? Is the king of the Jews. Now this placard that we have over here on this cross right here, it's got this statement in three different languages. It's got it in, uh, in Greek and Latin and Hebrew, all right? Only it's a little different wording of it. It's from another gospel and it's Jesus of Nazareth king of the Jews. But it's in the three different languages. Why in three different languages? Because it was right outside the city gates. That's where he's being crucified. And people coming and going and, and, and for the festival and thousands of people and so forth, they're all seeing it. And people from all over the world could read that sign. Remember what Pilate said when they put that sign up in the first place? You know, uh, I mean, what the uh, religious leaders said. They said, you know, no, don't put that. Put that he said he was king of the Jews. Just put that. And Pilate said, don't you tell me what to do. Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. And it stands. <laughs> Praise the name of Jesus. Word of forgiveness. That's the first one. Second one is a word of salvation. Look at verse 39 and following. It's right here. We don't even have to turn anywhere for it. 39 to 43. Look at this. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. See, a little bit more of that. Jesus, get down from the cross. Makes you wonder why. Everybody was so intent on that. Anyway. Could be. And maybe not, who knows. Anyway, um, it, turns, it says here that one of the malefactors was, uh, you know, um, picking on Jesus. Another gospel says they both were. So they both were until one of them changed his mind. One of them decided, no, this isn't right. And he got after the other one. And he said, listen, we deserve what we're getting. We deserve it. See, the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost thou not fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? Verse 41, And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing amiss. 
So they both started out ridiculing Jesus. One changes his mind. One gets after the other and says, no, we, we can't do this like this. And then that guy turns to Jesus and says, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. That, my friends, is his repentance. Amen? I said there's, there's a repentance. That's his repentance. He didn't get a whole lifetime to serve Jesus. He, I mean, he could have, but he didn't. Okay, he chose another lifestyle. And he, uh, he didn't go to church, probably didn't go to synagogue. I mean, we don't know the details, but, you know, he's not, he's not a religious person. You know, they're both wailing on Jesus. I mean, you know, they're both getting after him until he changes his mind. And that's the definition of repentance, changing your mind and going in a different direction. Amen? Remember me. You know what remember means? It, it means that you become a fixture in the mind. Lord, notice he calls him Lord. He means it, by the way. He means it. Listen, he's on a cross. He's got X number of minutes to live. He means it. Lord, remember me. Let me be a fixture in your mind. Grasp, grasp me mentally. Bear me in mind. Recollect me, whether it be for the purpose of reward or punishment. He was open to that. Lord, remember me. If it's going to be reward, fine. If it's going to be punishment, I deserve it. Amen? Praise the name of Jesus. By the way, this word remember is derived from the Greek word meno. Anybody remember what that is? Meno is the word that means abide. So when you say, Lord, remember me, you're saying abide. Take up residence in me. I'll take up residence in you and we'll be together. Amen? And Jesus said this. This is his next word from the cross. Verily I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Literally the word paradise refers to a place of future happiness. It's a park. I, uh, many years ago, I'm thinking it might have been the first Christmas that Cindy and I had married. Um, I was into metal sculpting a little bit and I made some things. I made Cindy a model of the uh, picture or the uh, statue of Jesus, 90 foot statue of Jesus. <laughs> Mine wasn't 90 foot, <laughs> about that tall, uh, of Jesus. And um, I'm not sure whatever happened to it. I, it probably got banged around in a move or something and uh, didn't survive. I haven't seen it in a long time. But anyway, I made her that. And then I made her mom and dad a, uh, a wall sculpture. A wall sculpture. I think Cindy probably said something about, where are they gonna put that? <laughs> well, they found a place all right. They put it above the organ down in the basement. And the basement was a finished basement, so it was used a lot. So it's not like they just stuck it off in a storage area. They put it up on the wall. And what it was, was a uh, statue, a small statue of Jesus, mimicking the one that I made Cindy, but it's real small. And then it, there was a fence. And in perspective, that fence was small, back by Jesus, because he's back in the distance. And then it got bigger and bigger and bigger as it came out. And it came out three or four inches from the wall, and was mounted to the wall. And it was called Peace Park. P-E-A-C-E. -E, Peace Park. Not the peace of, you know, no conflict. But the peace of recon being reconciled with a holy God. The real reason and the real meaning of peace. Peace Park. That's what paradise is. When it's used here in this case. It also refers to something not too far away from the Garden of Eden. Amen? All right. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Glory be to God.
The third statement that Jesus made from the cross is a word of love. If you'll turn over to John, please. John 19, verses 26 and 27. John chapter 19, verses 26 and 27. When Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, uh, most likely a reference to John himself, since he called himself that throughout his gospel, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He saith unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. I've had people try to read that, you know, like somebody will be preaching on it or something, and you go, Woman? You know, like, like getting after her. So, woman? No, it's not that at all. This woman is a term of endearment. Okay? It actually refers to a, um, let me get it here. Yes. Um, uh, to be specifically a wife and one who generates. Okay? A wife who's married and they have kids and then grandkids and then great grandkids and so forth. This is the woman. Once again, pointing to the fact that Mary had other children as well. Okay? And a lot of, some people don't believe that, you know. They say that she was a, had the virgin birth and that was it. She never had any other kids. <laughs> Except the Bible says she had at least two or three sons and two or three daughters and, you know, and they were even in the upper room for Pentecost. Praise God. So, you know, don't believe this stuff people make up. That's why we got to go by the word. Amen. Uh, gune, by the way, is the Greek word for this. has to do with one who generates. Woman, behold thy son. Now this behold, I told you this was going to be important throughout the story, is in, the, is in the imperative middle voice. Imperative meaning mandatory. Okay, woman, it's absolutely imperative. You must behold your son. Now he's not talking about himself. He's talking about John. I want you guys to get together. I want you to be a family. Okay? Then he says to John, he says to the disciple, Behold thy mother. So now Mary is going to be like a mother to John. And then right after that it says, and this is verse 27. This is John 19, verse 27. And from that hour, that disciple took her unto his own home. It's a dwelling. It's a family. They were now together. And what an encouragement that would be. Oh, just think about it. Think about the doubts that could run through Mary's mind with all of this. You know, her own son crucified right before her eyes. How can this amount to anything? How can this be a good thing? But she's got John to bounce everything off of. Amen? Not only that, but John's got Mary to bounce everything off of. Amen? He's got the mother of Jesus. She can go ahead and explain to him what it was like when he was young and he was being raised up and he started his ministry and, you know, before John ever knew him. This is all going to be shared between the two of them. Praise the name of Jesus. And then it's noon. And it's not midnight. <laughs> even though this is the darkest time of the day. It's noon. And for the next three hours, it's total darkness. And not one word is spoken. Oh, probably the other people are talking about things and so forth. But Jesus didn't say anything during that darkness. And as I said earlier, I have a feeling that's on purpose. <laughs> I'm sure it's on purpose. Jesus didn't do anything that wasn't on purpose. Amen? And so he's, he's not saying anything. He's trying to show them and us that when he speaks in the light, you'd better be listening because he's going to expect us to get through the darkness with everything he has already shared. And it's not that he can't speak in the darkness, but on the cross, he chose not to. All right? Without any communication in those three hours. Can you imagine? That's a long three hours. It was very dark. And when it's very dark, it's hard to take a step. Amen? I see it every night. I get ready for bed, 
and I still have my bed set up in the dining room. I have to make my way around the bed to get onto the other, into the other side. And I stub my toe about every night because <laughs> I can't see. Why don't I just move the thing that's in the way? <laughs> Might help, <laughs> right? Or I'll get a little lopsided a little bit and start to lean and I'll have to grab the bed. <laughs> Either coming or going, <laughs> all right? In the darkness, we don't have the best eyesight. Amen? That's, that's why you get a hold of some of that stuff. Joel's got at work, you know, that, that night vision stuff might help. <laughs> Could you see that? Wearing that at night. The day of the cross, the day on the cross, I should say, was almost over. It's three o'clock. Darkness is past. The fourth word that comes to us is a word of spiritual suffering. And that I would ask you to turn to Mark. We get three out of the four Gospels in this story. Look at uh, Mark chapter 15. Okay? Mark chapter 15 and it's verse 34. I'll start at 33. Okay? And when the sixth hour, which is noon, see how Mark calls it something else? Calls it the sixth hour? It's noon because his day started at sunrise, six o'clock in the morning. Okay? That's what I'm saying. So don't get confused about that. Still talking about the same crucifixion. Anyway, it's, it's noon. Okay? I mean, it was noon. And uh, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. So three hours of darkness. Now we're at three o'clock in the afternoon. And at the ninth hour, three o'clock in the afternoon, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, I want to kind of lay this out for you and uh, just ask you to think about something. Is it possible that God had not really forsaken Jesus? Because you've got to remember that this is a direct quote from King David. He's quoting King David, his ancestor. The Bible also says that God never forsook, never left King David. And yet you read through the Psalms and you find lots of places where he feels forsaken. I wonder maybe if, let me take a moment just to show you this. Could I do that? I ran across it in my daily reading just today. Psalm 30. Hold your place in, in Mark there and turn to Psalm 30. This is a psalm and a song at the dedication of the house of David. I don't, I'm not going to read the whole thing. Um, okay, well, let me just pick it up at verse 4. Okay, sing unto the Lord, O ye saints of his, and give thanks at the remembrance of his holiness. For his anger endureth but a moment. In his favor is life. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy cometh in the morning. And in my prosperity, I said, I shall never be moved. Lord, by thy favor, thou hast made my mountain to stand strong. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. Boy, God, it sure looked like you had forsaken me. Thou didst hide thy face, and I was troubled. I cried to thee, O Lord, and unto the Lord I made supplication. What profit is there in my blood when I go down to the pit? Shall the dust praise thee? Shall it declare thy truth? Hear, O Lord, and have mercy upon me. Lord, be thou my helper. Thou hast turned for me my mourning into dancing. Amen? You you hear it? Thou hast put off my sackcloth and girded me with gladness. To the end that my glory may sing praise to thee and not be silent. O oh, Lord my God, I will give thanks unto thee forever. And other places, the scripture is very clear 
that he had promised David that he would not leave him and he would not forsake him. All right? Unless David were to forsake him. There are scriptures that say that. Okay? But you want God, you got God. Amen? All right? Real clear. Well, so I just wonder, could it be that Jesus is quoting David to bring back the memory of all of the times that he felt alone? Um, let me make it even clearer. The very first word that he had from the cross was, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. God the Father was there. Jesus is praying to him. Amen? The very last statement that he makes from the cross is similar. Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. So at the beginning and at the end, and I believe all the way through, God is with him. All right? Now, okay, someday I go to heaven and God's going to say, no, that's not exactly accurate. Okay, I'm just suggesting. Could you think about it? Could you even just wonder about it? It, he's quoting King David. He's not, this is not something he's making up. He's quoting King David. And King David felt very alone, even though God said, you are not forsaken. Okay, see what I'm saying? So anyway, it opens it up to at least a little bit of a discussion that, um, you know, that, that God is with us. Do you hear me? Amen? That God is with us. And we may feel very much forsaken. But that's at night. <laughs> I mean, that, you feel that in the darkness of night. Right? Even if it's in the middle of the day like it was here at the cross. Okay? All right. Anyway. Just something to wonder about, I suppose. He's certainly not forsaken in the ultimate sense. You know, God raises him from the dead, and, you know, and, and he sits at the right hand of the Father and all of that kind of stuff. Okay, for he was the Son of God, but it was a very intense feeling. Felt very much alone. Sure felt like it anyway. Okay, anyway, then there's the fifth word, and the fifth word is one of physical suffering, and that is also in John. And uh, turn back to John. Should have told you to mark that. <laughs> John 19, verse 28. Right after the woman, behold thy son, and behold thy mother. Right after that, in verse 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Another communication. Now there was a set, there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar and put it upon a hyssop, long branch, and put it to his mouth. All right? Then there's the sixth moment of communication. It's called the word of triumph, and that's the next verse. Verse 30, when Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished, and bowed his head and gave up the ghost. In other words, he died. And I want you to notice, he chose when he was going to die. We can't do that, really. <laughs> you know, but he's God. And so, you know, there, in other words, he wasn't killed. He wasn't murdered. He wasn't even martyred. These are all words to describe something that somebody else does to you. No, he gave his life. Right? Right? God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Amen? Praise the Lord. And it means complete, finite, <laughs> okay? Uh, teleos is the Greek word. It means perfected. It means completely. It means accomplished. And lastly, to wrap it all up, there's the word of committal. All right, the last word spoken. It's the same thing at a funeral. 
they're moving away now from going to the cemetery because it's, you know, it's a lot of extra work and everything. But still, the pastor stands up there, even in the funeral home, and will go ahead and do the regular service. And then he'll have a short service called the committal. And that's what this is. This is the last word spoken. Okay? Turn back to Luke. Kind of appropriate we turn back to Luke for this. Luke, chapter 23, verse 46 and following. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. I don't know about you, but I'm sure glad God was there. Into thy hands I commend my spirit. To uh, place alongside is what this commend means. To present it for a deposit, so to speak. Okay? Trusting God to take care of this situation. And, uh, to trust and to protect. I want you to think about this for just a second. He's about to die, right? He's got to know that God's going to raise him from the dead. He's got to know that. How do you die not trusting God on that point? It's the same with us. We're promised a resurrected life. We surrender everything to the Lordship of Jesus Christ and we follow him and, and he stays with us and we're together and, and all of that. We're promised. He's not going to leave us. He's not going to forsake us. And he's going to raise us up in the last day, he says. Or in the case of the rapture, you know, whoosh, up we go. You got to know that. How do you die not knowing that? I mean, you hear me? Is it iffy? If it's iffy in your mind, you need to come to God and say, God, I want to know this. Amen? Amen? I think it's crucial. That's when he gave up the ghost. Once he died, that was it. God hadn't raised him. He'd rot in the grave. Amen? But God does raise him. Hallelujah. And before that, when the centurion saw what was done, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. In Matthew Henry, it specifically states, the son of God. All right? Also in the Gospel of Matthew, I believe it specifically states that all the soldiers felt the same way. So if there were four soldiers there plus a centurion, if there were eight soldiers there besides a centurion, we don't know how many, they all knew that this was the Son of God. That's what it says in Matthew. Amen? Here it just mentions the centurion, but you get the idea. And all the people, now watch this now, watch this, don't lose this. And all the people that came together to that site, to that location, okay, um, beholding the things which were done, smote their breasts and returned. In other words, went back home. Smote their breasts, beat their chest, praise God, amen? Beat their chest, grieving over this Death, this innocent man dying, beholding the things. Now watch, and all his acquaintance, in other words, the people he knew, and the women that followed him from Galilee, all of these people, they stood afar off. Now watch, beholding these things. Beholding these things. This is important now. Okay, it means they stood across from where this tomb was and they stared at it. They watched him put it, they watched them put him in there. All right, they stared at it, they discerned it, and they did so clearly. They knew this was the tomb, okay, and they uh, attended to it. All right, come Easter Sunday, you know they went to it. Uh, and uh, in other, and the, uh, the last definition is. They experienced it. That's what it all comes down to, people. We can't go by hearsay. We can't go by something we read, even if it's the Bible. It's got to be that you know Jesus raised from the dead. It had to be that for the disciples. Why wouldn't it be that for us? Amen? Otherwise, it's hidden, even when it's crystal clear to us. Did you ever think about this? Maybe it's crystal clear to us 
because, praise God, he's already shown himself to us as resurrected. Maybe that's why it's clear. That's what beholding is. It has to be experienced. And it's all over the place. That beholding is in 48. It's in 49. It's in 50. You know, and behold, there was a man named Joseph, a counselor, and he was a good man and a just man. And the same had not consented to the council. He had not agreed with what they did in close quarters. He didn't agree with it. He was of Arimathea, a city of the Jews, who also himself waited for the kingdom of God. And it would be Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus that would take down the body and get it ready. Put it in the tomb. Now, the women are right across the road. They're watching. And then when they come back on Sunday morning with a report that, you know, he's gone and where did they take him and all this stuff. See, they don't even suspect resurrection at first, even though he had said so. But it was holding from them, okay, until they actually see him raised from the dead. That's why they don't get it. Be careful about sitting back and, think, and thinking negatively of all these people because that's God's way. He'll hold it until it's going to be experienced. And that, but, but he still told you about it because he wants you, when you find out that he's really alive, he wants you to think back and go, he said that. That's right, I remember that now. If he hadn't said that, you know, because after all, he's going to hold it from you anyway, then they wouldn't have remembered it. You can't remember something you hadn't heard. <laughs> okay, amen? Amen. And they, they made claim that these women, one of the explanations for these women finding this tomb empty and all that is they got the wrong tomb. That was one of their stories. The religious leaders, they got the wrong tomb. The women did. How'd they get the wrong tomb when they sat for, I don't know, an hour and a half, two hours across the road and watched them deal with that tomb? How did they get the wrong tomb? I don't believe they did. I think they got the right one. See how phony and fake the excuses can be? Amen? Praise God, praise God, praise God. You see, Jesus wasn't in this thing alone. Amen? No way, no way was he alone. The father's there. His disciples are there. The women are there. There's lots of people there. His own mother is there. Okay? It was all in God's hands. And that includes him and his mission. It's not just Jesus in God's hands. It's his mission in God's hands. He intends to see that fulfilled. And he wants to use us to help fulfill it. Amen? That's why we need to see the risen Lord. Because otherwise, it's holding from us. All right? And it's a good thing it's in God's hands, amen? Because guess what? We wouldn't have handled this all too well. But it's in God's hands. He alone is the great communicator, so to speak. You know, they say this about President Reagan, you know, because he was, he was very good at sharing things with people and, and making it clear what he's talking about and so forth. And um, he, uh, I don't know if you remember this back in those days, but he, he often, he opened every press conference with a joke. <laughs> he had a joke. <laughs> Communicating, illustrating, revealing what's in his heart. And, uh, but Jesus is better than that. Amen? Jesus is better than that. He alone is the great communicator. Even from the cross. Praise God for that. Amen? Even from the cross. Father, thank you, Lord, dear God, for this truth here that's before us. All seven of these words are your communication to your people. And it's not that you expect everybody to understand everything you've said. 
because come Easter Sunday morning, you made it clear to them that it's when they meet you, when they have that experience with the risen Lord, that's when they understand what you said and why you said it. And I want to thank you for that, dear God. I think it's crucial that we know that to be the case. We thank you. We praise you, dear God. In Jesus' name. Amen.